Hello and welcome to this India Today special that celebrates 75 years of the Democratic Republic of India. A journey that began at the stroke of the midnight hour on 15th August 1947 when India became independent but with the painful partition of its territory. It created the base for the building of a modern India. A tough, arduous task because the next five years were tumultuous ones. The assassination of Mahatma Gandhi was a jolt that the young nation was still grappling with. When the attack from Pakistan happened, Kashmir became entangled in disputes that we are yet to resolve. But as a nation, we made bold strides. We adopted a republican constitution that established us as a socialist, secular, democratic republic in 1950 that put the citizen first. Two years later, we held our first parliamentary election based on the principle of one person, one vote. India Gate, there were loudspeakers all throughout, you know, in the, in the parks and everything. So we were sitting and I was only interested in the ice cream vendor. I kept on looking for the ice cream guy. So I was more busy eating ice cream. But then on the loudspeaker, Jawala Nehru's speech started coming directly broadcast from parliament. And I still remember at the age of seven years old, I remember Jawala Nehruji, our prime minister saying, long years ago, we made a twist with destiny. And a day comes only once. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge not only or in full measure but very substantially. The 15th of August on the one hand of course I was proud and delighted that we finally achieved independence but the situation in Kashmir at that time was very grim. Uh, they were already, uh, the raids had begun from Pakistan and the full-fledged ones would come a little later but the whole situation was very tense. The mistake also that we made, that Jawaharlal ji made, was to go to the UN under chapter 6 of the UN Charter which is these this disputes. We should have gone under chapter 7 which deals with aggression. But there was aggression, that's one. But we didn't. So, the Security Council was loaded against us. Uh, and they turned the aggression to Kashmir into an indo pak issue. So we are still living with it. 560 states. Uh, so there was an element in every state that they would become independent. The Mount Vernon said that from today, if you don't sign it, you are an independent people. Now, except half a dozen of them, they, they couldn't. Some of them were as small as uh, the area of Delhi, or even smaller. So, Patel to have got them to merge with, with the rest of India uh, it was a remarkable thing. And it was done without a single shot being fired. Millions of lakhs of refugees were pouring in to Delhi. The whole of Delhi had become a huge refugee camp. All these locations you see now, Kingsway camp, they were actual camps. And there were large numbers of people coming in great distress from um, Pakistan, Punjab. And it was really, quite frankly, uh, because of Jawaharlal Nehru and Sadar Vallabhai Patel. These two people steadied the ship of state. Otherwise, uh, Winston Churchill's uh, prediction that as soon as we leave, India is going to break into 20 pieces may well have been fulfilled. But they were there and they were able to manage the great turmoil and settle things. And Gandhi was against it. But at, by that time, he was already sidetracked by Nehru and Patel and um, others. And so he, on 15th August, he was not here. He was in Calcutta. He was not in Delhi. And also, you see, they didn't anticipate that there would be such an upheaval. 
the lakhs of people will migrate and tens of thousands would die. And I campaigned for the, <laughs> the, the Congress uh, uh, candidate for Bharatpur uh, against the wishes of my father. Uh, the candidate was the Maharaja's brother. He was standing as an independent against the Congress candidate. So he won, the Maharaja's brother won. Because, you know, uh, everybody was reactionary. In the states, the Congress didn't do so well uh, as they did in the rest of India, but they did well enough to get a huge majority. The decade following the first election of 1952 was a challenging one. But it was also a period of inspirational nation builders, leaders who built the foundation for an India of the future. But there were also difficulties. Remember, in 1962, there was the grave miscalculation of China, where Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's spirit was in a sense broken by the Chinese aggression. His belief and faith in mutual cooperation between neighbors was finally destroyed. It was a learning experience for India, a lesson that the country has never forgotten. Chinese were treacherous. Pandit Nehru was a trusting man. He was not a very pragmatic man in these things. He thought since he is peaceful, he is on a line, the whole world will follow his thought process. Shu and Lai came to India. We had that Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai famous slogan. But they would talk something else and do something else, which is what they are doing even today. That is in the Chinese DNA. So when the Chinese actually attacked on 20th October, It came as a big surprise to the politicians, to the intelligence community, not so much to the military because military perhaps had expected it. The feeling was that they are all over. Nobody knows where the Chinese are. They can ambush anybody. They can go behind you. So that caused a bit of a panic. Plus, of course, people were not ready. We didn't have the ammunition. We didn't have the weapons. We didn't have the clothing. We didn't have the equipment to... Soldiers fought very well. Some of the battalions they counted, they knowing fully well that they are fighting against very heavy odds. They carried on, most of them died because of that. There are examples of a Rajput battalion commanded by Colonel Navasti, who knowing fully well that he is surrounded by mountains, he said, let's go. And they went, most of the company that he was leading were killed. So it was not the soldiers' bravery that in any way was the cause of the defeat. Militarily, you were not prepared. Uh, you had a general, uh, Lieutenant General Call, who had never fought a war. He uh, seen no action. Uh, Krishna Man was Home Minister, uh, who used to keep the general out saying they are useless people. So the for Jawaharlal Ji to make Krishna Menon as Defense Minister uh, was a disaster. Mr. Kaur was the intelligence chief. He had assured Nehru that Chinese will not attack. So we went by that advice against the professional advice of the general who would have known. Uh, that is why ultimately we landed up with humiliation. We landed up with a trauma. A lot of people killed, territory lost. And Chinese added to that humiliation by unilaterally going away after a month. I think 21st November they withdrew after one month and one day. Uh, Nehru had a very sentimental and romantic idea of China. Uh, China historically. He was not able to understand the way the minds of Mao Zedong and Shun Lai worked. Uh, they had no sentimental attachment to India. Their attachments are purely practical. Nehru was a broken man. He survived only 18 months after that. He died in May 1964. And he wasn't the same man as he used to be in the parliament. He felt stabbed in the back. You see, he is a man of world stature. He was the originator of the non land movement. World knew Nehru. He was a world statesman. But after that jolt, I think, 
his image suffered, or at least he thought it had suffered. Defense minister who let him down was removed, but then he was moved as high commissioner to UK. The chief was removed, but he was also sent as ambassador to Afghanistan because it wasn't his fault. Any other chief would have met the same fate. If you uh, don't listen to the professional's advice, then uh, you are likely to cut a sorry figure. That also goes to the future war. There are few years in India's post-independence history that remain etched on the minds of millions of Indians quite like 1971. It was a year like no other. A year which saw Indira Gandhi, the daughter of Jawaharlal, really assert her political supremacy. First with a big election victory, riding on the slogan of Garibi Hatao. And then the 1971 war with Pakistan that resulted in the liberation and the formation of a new country of Bangladesh. 1971 will be a year that will be remembered for very long. I was in Mrs. Gandhi's cabinet for 10 years, from 1967 to 1977. You see, Indira Gandhi had this Garibi Hatao program, in which there were a number of elements. One of them incidentally included abolition of privy purses, and, and that was where I was in a slightly awkward position, because I was in the cabinet, I was drawing the purses, and the whole princely order was against. However, I stood with her on that. And I said, so that was, she used to do a lot. She won the election on the, on the Garibi Hatao uh, slogan. And I was there when the Bangladesh war took place. I was in the cabinet. And it was quite an extraordinary thing. Indira Gandhi showed remarkable leadership. You see, the refugees were pouring in. 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs. We were all wondering when she was going to act. But she knew what she was doing. I think Sam Manekshaw had made it very clear to her what was the correct time. And then she struck at just the right moment. And within 15 days, we had, well, that was a euphoric moment. I don't think any of you can realize how deeply emotionally India was involved in the Bangladesh war. And when we, when Bangladesh began, it was almost as if we had won our freedom again. Uh, and that was a high point of Indira Gandhi's uh, uh, ministry. She was at the top of the world. Uh, personally, I feel that she let Bhutto off rather lightly. I, I think she should have struck a harder deal. But she didn't take me to, to uh, Shimla. She took her advisors and of course the whole thing as I said the high point of Indira Gandhi's uh, Prime Ministership for the first 10 years uh, was Bangladesh victory no doubt I mean that was the you, you see uh, my seat in Parliament also came behind her and she very seldom showed any emotions but that morning she virtually ran into the house and with Mr. Speaker, I have an announcement to make, and the house fell deadly silent. Dhaka has fallen to India, and the house exploded. You can't imagine what it was like. And that was one of those moments which will never recur, perhaps, and which remain in, in the memory. If 1971 was a golden year, then 1975 was India's darkest hour post independence. Indira Gandhi, the Heroine of 1971 was transformed into the dictator of the 1975 emergency. In 1977, the emergency was lifted and the voters gave the leadership a befitting lesson. Indira was defeated and India showed that it could rise from the ashes of dictatorship to face the glorious sunshine of democracy once again. Everybody was, was shocked. No, no, nobody was affected. Tuck, tuck on my room here in the morning, 6 o'clock, kya baat hai bhi? 7 o'clock cabinet meeting. So, I said, it's very odd. I usually, so I got up, jaldi tayar hua, yaha se, si ghar se gaya. And it was stunned silence, sunnata. I was uh, posted in London at the time as the deputy high commissioner. And B.K. Nehru was the high commissioner. 
Now to sell the emergency in London was impossible. There were too many people there who knew India, including Englishmen, uh, in 1975. Uh, so it was very tough uh, to get it across. Uh, and many, you know, a lot of people felt that it shouldn't have been done. Uh, but we were employees of the government, so it was our job. Uh, to propagate it uh, to the entire British press was hostile uh, the government was uh, I mean not that enthusiastic I mean you, you they were polite uh, but nobody liked the fact that you had uh, that she had uh, imposed uh, emergency and uh, it was very unpopular in India uh, no two, two ways about it but when emergency happened I went to I had just joined BBC in Delhi and Mark Tully was my senior, my boss. And that morning when I went and he said, well, I'm glad you're here, old boy, and I'm leaving. I said, leaving where? He said, I'm going back to England. I said, why? He said, well, we have to close down this office, so I don't have much time, so just quickly come to my room and we will discuss. And he said, we have to close it down. He said, everything we have, the cars, just sell them off and refrigerator we had, we had air conditioner, we just sell them off and don't bother about the prices. Whoever comes to sell them. And I was under, you know, shocked. And he said okay, only yesterday, well, you were not here, the information minister, Shukla, he came to the office and he talked to Mark and he said, you have to sign an agreement of censorship. And Mark said, he said, what is this censorship about? He said, all the stories you do, we will have to see and then you can go and broadcast it. So Mark said, I'm sorry, the BBC rule is that we will never ever accept any censorship anywhere. So I can't sign it. So he had a cup of tea and he was very polite to Mark, but he said, I'm afraid if you don't sign it, you can't broadcast. He said, okay. So he called London and said, this is the situation. They said, close down and come back. During the emergency, although Sanjay Gandhi did not hold any official position, but he was like the right-hand man of Mrs. Gandhi. And he was everywhere. And his wife, she is now Menka, she is now in BJP, and she was always with Sanjay, everywhere. So there was one hearing going on in Tee Sazari. So I, out of curiosity, I went there to see what this is all about. So there was this case against uh, Sanjay Gandhi about people being evicted from Old Delhi. So there is there is an area called Teliyonka Phatak in Turkman Gate. So lots of Muslims were evicted from there and they were transported to Jamnapar in a colony uh, there. So there was a huge protest, there were newspapers, items there and all that. So he was summoned by a judge in Tisadari. And it was amazing. I wish I could make a film of it. Sanjay and Menka has no, no respect for the judge who was sitting there. In fact, the judge was very nervous and was calling Sanjay Gandhi sir. And I was very bemused. This judge calling an accused sir. As soon as this announcement was made, one other colleague about my age, I don't want to mention his name and I, we went for a long drive. I mean, like, do we support her now or do we not support her? If we don't support her now, we are out and probably in Tihar jail for the next six months. And she has put a lot of faith in us, although we are young. I don't think we should let her down at this stage. So we decided to stick. I won my election in 1977. I was the only minister and only three people from North India won. Everybody else lost across the board. Even though I was health minister, I won. And we got 150 seats from the south and only three from the north. So I was in this whole thing, I was in parliament when the Janata came and Muradji Bhai came and then Chaudhary Charan Singh came. And then. So, you know, they all collapsed and then she came back again in 79. I mean, it's a strong thing. 
So uh, people may have been disappointed with the emergency, angry with the disappointment, but I don't think that they lost their basic affection for her. There will never be another emergency in India. And that uh, somebody from the Nehru family should do it was very ironical. Uh, the Nehru daughter should do it. Uh, and, yes. and I think uh, she was ill-advised. The 1980s will be seen as a decade of political turbulence in the country. It had begun with the euphoria of Indira Gandhi returning back to power, only to find herself being besieged by insurgencies and rebellions. None more dangerous and unsettling than what was happening in the Punjab, where Sikh separatism, as reflected in the Khalistani movement, had reared its ugly head. Indira Gandhi responded with brute force. Operation Blue Star was a miscalculation that would cost the former Prime Minister her life. Indira Gandhi was assassinated, bringing to an end a bloody and tumultuous period in Indian politics. Operation Blue Star happened in a very dramatic fashion. I don't know for what reason, there were a lot of foreign journalists who were in Amritsar, uh, including me and Mark Tully and many several others. The army trucks came and they told us to pack up and we are going to escort you uh, right up to Ambala and go home. We don't need you here. And luckily I was not there at that time. I was wandering around. When I came back, the manager and other people said, I said, where is Mark? He said, he's gone back. I said, why? He said, the army escorted them. So, and he said, you be careful because they don't know. They didn't have a list who are there. So you are lucky that you are still there. And I covered the last press conference of Bindrawale in the Golden Temple just a day before Operation Blue Star started. And uh, he didn't say anything important. He used to dramatize a lot, Bindrawale. And he used to speak in Punjabi. So my Punjabi is not too bad, but not as good as his Punjabi, because he spoke pure. Uh, you know, village type of, and anyway, but what he was saying, that they can't throw me out, my dead body will go from here or something like that. And then the next day, there was curfew all around Namrissa in the old city, and the operation started. But it was a shock for the army, because they lost a lot of, they had a lot of, suffered a lot of casualties, because they had not done any, any monitoring or any recce of that area. So they did not realize that the main gate where the steps are, so they were underground things and they were having guns. And when the soldiers came, they shot them. And many of them fell down because of their, their feet were injured. And on the third day, they had to bring the tanks in. And the tanks were brought and they, they attacked the Akal Takht because Bindrawale and all his colleagues, they had all taken shelter there. And then on the... Uh, on a Saturday, I remember, we were told that the curfew has been relaxed and we can go to the Golden Temple. So we went into the Golden Temple and the bodies of Bindrawale and three, four other important people were just laid down there uh, on, on stone benches. So we photographed that too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame Indra Gandhi for that because it was an army operation. The commander in chief of the Indian army who uh, was very confident because Indian army is a powerful army and they were confident that Golden Temple is a small place and they can wipe out Bindrawale from there and it will be a matter of a day or a few hours and then it will be all right. But surprisingly, it didn't happen that way. Among the journalists, we, we did uh, talk about it that Mrs. Gandhi's life uh, will be in danger because these Khalistanis were very mad people. They were not afraid of being killed. Although Binnawala uh, had passed away, he died, but then you couldn't take any chances. So we wondered about it, that Mrs. Gandhi has to be extra careful. That's what we thought. But the way Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated was dramatic because that happened in October, end of October. Um, 31st October. 
and she died inside, just outside her home. Uh, it was a very unfortunate thing. In Delhi, the scene was different. They were not, uh, uh, not very quiet. The, the Sikhs were, we, they were distributing sweets outside Gurdwara. They were stopping people and traffic and giving them uh, sweets and all that. And that angered the supporters of Congress party. And there was a Congress uh, minister who belonged to uh, the Jamnapar areas. And there the worst massacre started. Uh, of the Sikhs in that area because they were, you know, dancing and celebrating it. And that happened then in Connaught Place. There were lots of Sardar Sikh shops in Connaught Place. They were looted. And there were lots of people, we don't know who these people were, but assuming they were all Congress supporters. And there was total, there was, it was totally lawlessness everywhere in the afternoon. And it continued for three, four more days. Rajiv Gandhi became the sixth Prime Minister of India, riding a sympathy wave after his mother Indira's assassination. The Congress won more than 400 seats in the 1984 election. But soon that brute majority would turn into an unsettling and chaotic period in Indian politics. First, VP Singh raised the question of corruption in the Beaufort's gun deal. A period of coalition governments would follow with several prime ministers attempting to bridge the divides that were emerging in Indian society. One of those fault lines was that of caste. The Mandal Commission recommendations would lead to student unrest and more. It was to be another period of turbulence in Indian politics. Rajiv Gandhi became the prime minister. He had a lot of sympathy because her mother was assassinated. But uh, many people were happy about his choice in the Congress party because we interviewed a lot of people and we found that huge number of Congress people were happy that Rajiv Gandhi became the Prime Minister. And in the beginning he had a good team and one of them was Arun Singh whom Rajiv Gandhi appointed as the Defence Minister. And he was a good man. But unfortunately, Beaufort ruined the good story of Rajiv Gandhi's prime ministership because it was something Rajiv Gandhi failed to control because his wife was blamed. I'm not saying that she was guilty of it, but his wife was blamed because she had a very close Italian friend who, who was working in Delhi for some Italian company. So people thought that they were the ones who persuaded Rajiv Gandhi to sign the agreement of Bofors with Sweden. But I don't think that was the case. The guns uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, acquired after that, they were very good guns. And that made Indian Army very strong. Pakistan was our problem at that time, and those guns were very useful to us. Rest the fact that, the, that Indian politicians in general are number one, corrupt, number two, totally self centered, and basically not India centered. Yeah, this, 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 is, this I saw at close quarters. DP Singh was an exception. Which is why he paid the price. Land ownership was maybe in the hands of upper caste, but the pillars of the soil and who had been empowered by the land reforms of the 1940s were all OBCs. Now they had no place in the modern economy, but they were making money and they wanted to enter the modern economy. That was the origins of the Mandal Commission report of 1979. The demand had been there from even earlier. You know. So what VP told me was that if we don't do this, there will be a, there'll be a re rebellion, and the, these people will will it will, be, it will even become violent because they have one full generation of people have done well. The children have got to school. Those children do not want to become farmers. 
they want jobs, urban jobs, jobs with, you know, you know, in the, in the sector, international English, trans, trans India, etc., um, industrial jobs, office jobs. For that, you you have got to find space for them, and this is why we. They by themselves have not yet got the capacity to come in on the basis of competition alone. So we must make some space for them. Now this had been not decided by VT Singh. It was decided in 1979 but not implemented. You know, precisely because of the fear of the reactions of the upper castes, which you saw, 111 or 119, uh, uh, boys and girls killed themselves. You know, everything he was doing, Benefited who? The, the OBCs and the Dalits. One way or the other, whichever way you look at it. Both, these are the groups that turned against him. You, you know, why? Because they had leaders, Chandrasekhar, who was furious that he had not become Prime Minister. Devi Lal, who actually turned on me one day to my intense surprise in public, the public, public meeting. And, 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 and said that you are responsible for giving him advice that is causing up my, my problems with him. I had hardly spoken to VP about any, in any political matter, but he thought because I'm close to him, this is what I meant, that, you know, your media advisor, you're seeing him every day, therefore everyone assumes you're very powerful. And I was not powerful at all. You know, so this, Devi Lal turned on me physically at, 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 at a function. This is, these people were all just out to, 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 to get power and then turned the power into money for themselves. And you get in the middle of it an idealist prime minister. The early 1990s were a period of uncertainty in Indian politics yet again. Not only were the forces of caste now asserting themselves, but old communal animosities were also playing out. On the 6th of December 1992, the Babri Masjid would be demolished in Ayodhya, leading to riots across the country. The genie of communism had been unleashed. The BJP was the political beneficiary, emerging as a rising force in Indian politics on the debris of a masjid that had been demolished. I very distinctly remember the day Babri Masjid was demolished and I felt very very sad I am one of those who had the good fortune of working very closely with both Lara Krishna Advani ji and also Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji and I have the highest respect I continue to have the, have the highest respect for Advani ji and of course uh, At Atal ji is no more but let me tell you that I have had any number of conversations with both of them on the Babri Masjid Ayodhya controversy and both of them had nothing but remorse for what happened on December 6, 1992. Advaniji himself said that it was the saddest day in his life. The demolition should not have happened. The problem would have been and should have been solved in a peaceful, legal and harmonious way. So the action of the Kar Sevaks was not supported by Advani ji at all, nor by Atal, Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji. I have been a supporter and let me make it very clear, I have no uh, hesitation in saying this, I have been a supporter of construction, reconstruction of Ram Mandir at Ayodhya. I have supported the demand of the Ayodhya movement that there should be a Ram Mandir at Ayodhya because Ram is a deity for Hindus. Ram is also a symbol of unity of India. What happened in the, from about the late 80s onwards initially was that we saw the dying gasp of an old order. The Nehruvian consensus with which had governed India from about the 50s onwards was coming to an end. It, it had really, it, it had lived out its life. And it was that last gasp 
which was then which had created all this confusion and there was in in india a yearning for something new it was still a confused yearning in very ways various cross currents were there the ayodhya demolition of the 1991 to my mind i would just like to quote uh, vs naipaul in this respect and he'd say it was really the revenge of a defeated people and it was really that it was an assertion of a lot of pent up emotions impulses which were expressed itself now the question was not so much the demolition but what happened afterwards of course you know if you look at it from a political angle uh it has had uh, the obvious impact of giving a big push to the bjp but unfortunately we look at all these things from a political angle and political parties also take advantage undue advantage of communal differences in our country so we need to depoliticize all such questions that we have inherited from the past such as the ram janmabhoomi issue the court of course has given an order and now the construction of the ram temple also has begun but it would be better even now if in hindu and muslim communities work together both for the construction of the ram temple and also construction of a mosque in ayodhya and both temple and mosque should become symbols of hindu muslim unity if the forces of mandal and masjid would change indian politics forever in the 1990s there was another force that was also emerging that of market economics india embarked on the pathway of economic liberalization in 1991 almost forced to do that by a balance of payments crisis helmed by narsimha rao as prime minister and manmohan singh as finance minister the indian economy would be finally unleashing its animal spirits india would never be the same again real change in economic policy which was long overdue came in 1991 uh with when mr narsimha rao was prime minister and dr manmohan singh was the finance minister and that actually introduced the sorts of changes that many economists had been saying were needed but were earlier thought to be excessively controversial and the economy did well as a result of those changes let me say that it's not that the crisis uh caused the need to break away uh, the need to break away was evident even earlier uh, because our longer term growth rate was not getting to where it ought to be what the crisis did was it created an environment in which a new government came in i mean the narasimha rao government was a change of government mr vp singh who had sort of presided over the year which created the which led to the crisis uh left government there was a change of government and a new government was able to seize the opportunity not just to control the crisis but also to bring about structural reforms you know this is very important because the crisis could have been controlled without undertaking structural reforms what i think the government did was it saw the opportunity given the crisis that it had a couple of years when it could persuade people that we really need to do things uh, more drastic not just for the crisis but to get the economy to grow as rapidly as we thought it could and i'm glad that they did that and it worked i mean the economy is unrecognizable because of the initiatives taken in 1991 they were not implemented in my view as rapidly as they should have been i mean for example i'm not a great believer that we should do everything within a year or two but i think we should have been faster what we did in the 30 years after the reforms uh, should have been done in the first 15 but the same thing applies now for the future i mean we we've, we've seen how you talk about reforms but then they don't get done so i think we need to recover from that and get the right thing done fast and in a time bound manner as a tumultuous decade of the 1990s drew to a close india entered a new millennium under the reassuring leadership of atal bihari vajpayee the ultimate consensus builder vajpayee would become the first non-congress prime minister to complete a full 5 year term 
But in 2004, Vajpayee was surprisingly defeated. And what emerged was a UPA government helmed by Dr. Manmohan Singh over the next decade with Sonia Gandhi holding, some believed, the keys to power. It was a decade of relative stability, of high economic growth, of a momentous nuclear deal with the United States. But it was also a decade where there were allegations of scams and big ticket corruption. The system is misinformed, but I admit that there were several reasons why the enormous achievements of those 10 years have been overshadowed by the criticism. Firstly, we did not market those achievements. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was an able administrator, but he did not politically market. He was not a political animal. He was not a political person. Uh, in the way Mr. Narendra Modi markets his achievements as well as non-achievements, the Prime Minister never took upon himself the responsibility to market those achievements. And thirdly, the CNAG, I think he was a good officer, but a very bad controller and auditor general. I think uh, he was uh, either misguided or he misguided himself in publishing damning reports which had no basis at all. Uh, he said that in the 2G scam, uh, there was a notional loss of a 1,64,000 crore. Now, where is that uh, 1,64,000 crore which the government lost? And I think uh, all these factors contributed to our failure to market our achievements. The Manmohan Singh government, when he was prime minister, that is UPA 1 followed by UPA 2, I mean, right up to 2010, from about 2000, the first six or seven years of that government, you had a pretty high growth rate, in spite of the fact that you had the Lehman Brothers crisis internationally, that was quite well managed. But then, you know, in any economic management, some problems invariably arise. In this particular case, you had a rise of inflation, and inflation is a very sensitive issue. It's the one economic issue that people get a sense of and respond to practically on a daily or a weekly basis. So I think they had, they had a perception that inflation is not in control, and it wasn't. And it was difficult to bring it down. Uh, there was also, later on, of course, you had a whole string of uh, allegations of scams, etc. And I think probably the government didn't handle those very well. I mean, again, I don't know how you handle these things. Uh, but clearly, by the end of that particular government, uh, the better economic performance in the first seven years uh, had receded in people's memory. You know, people also tend to think of economic performance, they take it for granted that look, this is, this is we that are doing it, this is the country that's performing, it's not the government. And then something else occupies their attention. And from, from a political point of view, uh, it's for the ruling party in power to address that challenge. I don't think uh, we tried to uh, place Mrs. Gandhi over Dr. Manmohan Singh. Both had defined roles. One was head of the government and one was head of the party. And the party leader always deferred to the head of the government and gave him great and enormous respect. But uh, in retrospect, I believe this diarchy doesn't work. Uh, the leader of the party must also be the prime minister. Or the prime minister must become the leader of the party. This diarchy did not work is what I, in my uh, retrospective uh, assessment, uh, seems to be a, been a factor. In 2014, India would see an election that would redefine Indian politics. The BJP would come to power for the first time with an absolute majority. And the next Prime Minister of India was someone who was the first post-independence born Prime Minister of the country. Narendra Damodar Das Modi would be India's 14th Prime Minister signaling an end, many believed, to the era of Nehruvian consensus and the era of the rise 
और मोदित्व आई एम नॉट अ सपोर्टर ऑफ नरेंद्र मोदी और हिज स्टाइल ऑफ गवर्नेंस टूडे नेवर द लेस एज अ डेमोक्रैट आई रिस्पेक्ट पीपल्स मैंडेट बोथ इन 2014 थाउजेंड फोर्टीन एंड टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन द पीपल टूडे और लार्ज सेक्शन ऑफ द पीपल हैव सपोर्टेड द बीजेपी अंडर नरेंद्र मोदी लीडरशिप एंड देर मे बी रॉन्ग्स देर आर मेनी रॉन्ग्स दैट हैव हैपन इन द लास्ट एट ईयर्स बट इंडिया हैज ऑल्सो प्रोग्रेस्ड एंड इंडिया प्रोग्रेस लेट मी लेट मी टेल यू दैट इट इज नॉट द आउटकम of any one single government or one single party the supporters of narendra modi make the mistake of attributing all of india's progress only to the last 8 years which is a very wrong attitude you know the period after 2014 is not a a, a single period in a way uh, i would say that the uh, first two or three years of uh, the present government between 2014 and 2016 uh, the growth rate was picking up and the economy seemed to be getting back to the higher growth rate that it had earlier uh, this was somewhat destabilized by the demonetization effort and subsequently by the introduction of the gst now let's be clear the gst is a very good tax reform but you know good tax reforms uh, can very often create some problems if they're not implemented as well as they should be and also there are always glitches i mean all countries that have introduced gst type tax reforms have had problems so you have that period when the growth wasn't really all that good and then suddenly we got hit by the covid pandemic now actually the growth rate had been falling even before the pandemic then in the pandemic the growth rate collapsed but it became negative and it was a large negative but on the other hand it also recovered quite a bit so the present position is we seem to have recovered uh, what we had lost uh, in the sense that the gdp in the current year is likely to be a little higher than it was prior to the pandemic but you know that is 2 years later and normally you would expect it to be significantly higher in this period i think uh, major the major problem that has arisen is that inflation has shot up inflation was very comfortable earlier it has shot up some of this is again due to international developments in commodity prices and oil prices uh since demonetization which was a terrible decision the historical blunder this government has grappled with the economy it has had some successes more failures uh and then of course the external events the pandemic and the ukraine war leave that aside my biggest worry is that the space for democracy freedom liberty is shrinking the democratic space has shrunk under mr narendra modi surely no one who's a keen observer will say that the democratic space is enlarged or expanded mahatma gandhi was a great Ma- ram bhakt the last words that he uttered when he was shot by nathuram godse was hey ram but hey ram was a very different kind of a slogan and today's jai shri ram slogan is very different one was a slogan one was a cry for unity for harmony for brotherhood for asking sanmati as mahatma gandhi used to say in all his bhajans in all his prayer meetings sabko sanmati de bhagwan today's jai shri ram has become a war cry coercing muslims to say jai shri ram which is very wrong it is un hindu anti hindu and anti national the past eight years of the government has been choppy in many ways but i think what is important to note is that we found a direction i think what we are seeing is a very self confident india which is on the make we are seeing an india which is now 
demanding and getting a place on the high table of the world we are seeing an india which is of greater pride to its own citizens and which is held up as an example in large parts of the world we are seeing an india which is not beset by unceasing political uncertainty we are seeing an india which is now got a certain decisive form of leadership we are seeing an india whose future the best years are yet to come and but we are getting there i think overall i would say in the 75th year of indian independence i on my part remain tremendously optimistic about the future at 75 india is a vibrant young democracy through the ups and downs and the turbulence of the last 75 years we have come out a stronger nation yes there are promises to be fulfilled inequalities that need to be bridged institutional decline that needs to be arrested challenges facing the legislature executive judiciary and of course us in the media but we have come a long way from being a british colony in 1947 to a proud independent republic today we value our spirit of tolerance of accommodation of harmony and our diversity which is unique and like no other we the people of india have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep as we move and march forward to remaining a confident independent republic jai hind